Uh, my name is Fred. I am 31 years old. I am married. Sorry, ladies. And uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All the ladies are like, why would I want to marry a chubby short guy? <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> so good to be with you. I am married to love my life, Anna. Uh, in March, we've been married 10 years together, 13 years. I know. I know. I think we have a photo of my wife. There she is. Look at, look at that look she's given me. You know what I mean? That's a, like a I love you kind of look. Do you know what I mean? That's like a let's have another baby kind of look. You know what I'm saying? And so um, she's amazing. On that, we, seven weeks ago, six weeks ago, did have our first baby, baby Micah. I think we've got a, uh, a photo. There she is doing her thing. That's like, that's like six days after Anna gave birth and little Micah's there in her little thrift jacket. Oh, man, can I tell you, this is the first time I've been away since my baby's been born, and I love you, and I'm going to preach like a dying man to dying people and come back tonight and preaching a different sermon, but I'm so excited to get on a plane in the morning and go and hug my daughter. Um, you know, I tell her it was easier with no kid. Like, I love Anna so much, but I'm like, I'll see you in a week, you know? Um, but with my baby girl, and then she, fa- this has got nothing to do with anything, but just, just listen. Um, I FaceTimed her last night, Micah, not Anna, and Micah smiled at me. And I'm sitting in the hotel, and I'm like, I'm the worst father on earth. I'm missing her entire journey. What does this have to do with the message in the sermon? Nothing. It's just therapy for me. Let's chat amongst yourselves for a second. Oh, it's hot. <laughs> hey, I believe that uh, in the next couple of minutes, we're going to have a great time. The 9 a.m., God moved powerfully. I don't know exactly how many, but many people responded and gave their hearts to the Lord, which is beautiful. Uh, and this altar was full. And I believe we also don't have as much of a time restriction. I just believe God's got something for us. Because yeah. let's talk as Christians for a moment. Uh, it's so easy to just get caught in the minutiae of church. We go to church. We sing the songs. We sit down. Stand up. Yeah. Have you ever autopilot encouraged the sermon? Like you're not even, no one's going to do anything, but you're like, yeah, man. They just said like, you know, my granddad just died. You're like, come on, preacher. <laughs> you know, they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> but it's so easy to get caught up in just the rigmarole of church. And, but I want to encourage you this morning that, that let's not just play church. Let's be aware that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has walked into the room. Let's be aware that there's, a, there's, a, there's an application for our need. There's a God who saves. There's a God who heals. And I believe that he's going to move powerfully this morning. I also believe that we can have fun in church. And so I believe we're about to have a bunch of fun. And uh, if you have a Bible, just quickly, who actually has a Bible here? One. Thank you, man. Where is it, King David? And a phone doesn't count. If your Bible turns on, it doesn't count. <laughs> That's good. We, uh, we've just been uh, moving in our church. We've been trying to encourage our leaders to bring physical Bibles. And uh, yeah, it's not going well. So, <laughs> like my executive, I was like, bro, where's your Bible? He's like, I brought my iPad. I'm like, no. He's like, it's not my phone. I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> so anyway, let's just refocus. Um, also, forgive my pubescent voice. I was with the, shout out to the youth team. Any youth team here? So I was with the youth team for a couple of, so a couple of them, we've had a big couple of days, uh, and they stole my voice. So I just want to warn you that my voice might break, it might drop, it might, and you can't laugh at me, okay? Because I'm family, so don't do that. All right, Genesis, are you there? Yep, on your Bible. <laughs> Genesis 1.15 says this. After these things, the word of the Lord has me with the Bible here, but I'm reading it on here. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing as I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, not one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one will not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now towards heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. One more verse and then we'll pray and then we'll preach. Psalm 147, 4 says, he counts the stars, he calls them all by name. He counts the stars, he calls them all by name. Father, we thank you this morning for your presence at this 11 a.m. service. God, we ask that your beauty, your magnificence, your power, your anointing would fall in this service, that we would leave different than we turned up. We would experience you in a new and a fresh way. 
in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want to preach you a sermon uh, this morning called The Trouble with Tents. The Trouble with Tents. Real quick, quick poll. And also, the 9 a.m. failed here. About four people were involved. So let's all get involved. Who here likes to camp? Give me a hand. Show me a hand. Whoa, a lot of you. Who here hates camping? I'm here with all of my people. Okay, camping is the worst. I'm going to tell you why. So my wife is on a mission, an agenda, if you will, that I believe is demonic. And that agenda is to turn us into a family that camps. I will not become a family that camps. I'm the head of my household. <laughs> Last Christmas, we, we kind of knew it was probably going to be our... We did know. We just found out. We knew it was going to be our last Christmas, just us two. And Anna said, let's go camping. I said, where would we go? She said, let's go to the caravan park at Malulaba and we'll hire a tent. I said, why? She said, it'll be fun. Wake up in a tent. I said, where would we shower? She's like, in the caravan park. I was like, this idea sucks. I said, why would we, during summer, leave our house with our air conditioning, our fridge, functional toilet, air conditioning, my PlayStation, my dog, Zane? Why would we leave to go and stay in a cloth house, <laughs> eat 7-Eleven hot dogs, and go to a toilet that's shared by 150 strangers? <laughs> I don't want to do any of that. Now, you might go, oh, he probably rolled over and went camping. I didn't. <laughs> we went to the Hilton for three nights. <laughs> That's what's up. Thank you for clapping. If you like camping here, we're going to have an extra altar call after <laughs> for you. But the, the text we read, Abram, he was nomadic, and, and, and he would have moved from place to place and lived in a tent. Actually, he would have lived in what was called a yurt, which was a tent made of cow's hide. Isn't that exciting? And... Um, <laughs> And he would move from place to place to place, and he was nomadic, and he, he moved around. Speaking of moving around, I, I'm actually not from Australia. And I know I sound like such an Aussie, such a manly man, you know what I mean, Shannon? Like, just, yeah, come on, mate, yeah, shivers, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I was born in England, in London, and, uh, which is a real shame because I said this to the nine, I said all this to the night. It's the same sermon. <laughs> but, but we have the worst accents. Listen to me, Australians. We have the worst accents in the world. We sound like we are perpetually having a nasal infection. If you want a good preaching voice, you need to be born in America. I don't know if I agree. I'll prove it to you. Aussie. God loves you, bro. He's going to use you in Wangara, all the way down to Bustleton, Geraldton. He's going to use you. It's Aussies, right? Americans. <laughs> God loves you, bro. He cares about you. He formed you in the innermost parts of your mother's womb. And I just feel today, you're like, he does. He loves me. When an Aussie says it, you're like, Maybe. I don't know if I agree. Who gave you the ability that we just tore poppy swings up, you know what I mean? If you want to be an evangelist, you need to be Ben Fitzgerald or South African. I tell you right now, God is going to fall in this place, huh? The power of an almighty God will come and a fire will fill your bellies. Yeah, but if I did that as me, you would have half clapped. Anyway, that took way too long. I'm from England, and my biological mum had me when she was 16 years old. Is there any 16-year-olds here? Just real quick. Maybe over here. Is that, a, is that a hand? Okay, you. she didn't want you to put your hand up. You have. Uh, but you two, imagine giving birth to me. I know. Not at this size. I would have been smaller. <laughs> but... My biological mum gave birth to me. My biological dad uh, was a Muslim and, and didn't want any part of having a, having a kid and, and, and he left her. And she, I'm so thankful to her because she, uh, with all the odds stacked against her, circumstance screaming at her, she was like, I'm going to give this, this baby a chance of life. And so she had me in the hospital and then left. And so I was left at Hackney General Hospital and this is 1992 and 
uh, Hackney was a really rough place, really rough. And, and so there wasn't, uh, the, the foster homes were often full. And so there was a lady called Mary who would literally, you can't do this now because of legal reasons, but would look after babies that were waiting on a foster home. And so I lived with this lady, Mary, for 10, 12 months. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to be heretical, but there was no one around when I was born. I was raised by someone called Mary. Just, just, you just do the, wow, that was super delayed. <laughs> everyone was like, everyone was like, oh, the Bible, the Bible. <laughs> So I was, I was with Mary and she was amazing and, and I don't remember her obviously because I was 10 months. But then I went to a foster home run by a lady called Cheryl in Hackney in government housing and we had about nine foster kids in the one house. And I shared a room with about three to four foster sisters and it was the age of the Spice Girls. It was the age of troll dolls. And so they would dress me up and like do my hair and make me play with dolls and I have a thousand issues because of that. Uh, but honestly, Cheryl did an amazing job at making a hard place, a tough place, a poor place feel like home. She bought us a little duckling and it was called Donald and it had a jacket and I, we used to chase it around the yard and, and, and the yard was about four by four metres and we didn't have, there was no retaining wall, it had been kicked down so there was barbed wire at the back but Cheryl did a great job. She was loving, she was kind, even with the barbed wire. And so, but the goal, when you're in a foster home, the goal and the hope is that you get adopted. And so when I was about three and a bit, Cheryl said, Freddie, there's, some, there's a couple coming tomorrow to take you out for the day. And even at three and a half, I was like, pressure's on. You think you know pressure? Try and work your way into a family. <laughs> it's like, I'm really great. <laughs> I'm sure I'll grow up to be an engineer or something. You know? <laughs> Please adopt me. <laughs> look, look how high I can jump. You know? <laughs> so anyway, the next day, there's a knock at the door, and this couple are there, and I go down, I open the door, I remember there's this tall, skinny man with red hair, like Pastor Shannon. <laughs> Pastor Shannon's been actually hosting me amazingly. Can we just give Pastor Shannon a hand? He's been looking after me, taking care of me, taking me out for food, taking me outside for cigarettes. It's been so good. <laughs> if you're new in this place, we didn't go out for cigarettes. Went out for beer. No. <laughs> so, so this go down, I open the door, this couple's standing there, this woman in workout gear and Nikes with curly laces. First thing I said to her was, I like your shoes. And then we went out on what was called a trial day. Yes, friends, in 1994.5 in England, you could have a trial day with a child. They don't do this anymore because of psychological reasons. But you know how sometimes you like buy a pair of jeans or you get a new jacket at the store and you think you look great in it? I look great, you get home, you put it on, you look in the mirror, you're like, did I gain 40 pounds before I got home? Like, what is wrong with me? And so what do you do? Take it back to the store. You used to be able to do that with kids. So the pressure was on, right? So we go out to a park. They, they, they brought a pram, which is pretty presumptuous because they hadn't adopted me yet. They bought a pram in faith. And so I think we got a picture of the day they took me out in the pram. There I am. Look at me. I'm just looking at, looking at this man. I didn't even know him. Look at, in my face. You can see I'm like, adopt me, you know, please. <laughs> My life's really hard. My dad's a Muslim. <laughs> People always get weird about that bit. He is. It's all right. Everyone's like, oh. <laughs> he is. I'm not throwing shade. And so we're out and we're about it. We're doing our thing. And they take me to where they live, which is a place called Cheam. Now, you've got to understand the difference between Cheam and Hackney. I don't know... WA suburb, so I won't make a comparison, and I get in trouble when I do that because the people from the Hackney suburb get mad at me, so I'll just say this. Hackney was rough, Cheam was dope. In Hackney, you look at someone wrong, and they're like, you're right, mate, you want to go, you want to have a bubble? You're like, what's a bubble? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. In Cheam, man, people walk different, people talk through their teeth, people have good jobs, they have tea and crumpets on the deck, and talk about their earnings, and how good life is, what, what. So we drove from Hackney to Cheam and we get to Cheam and they open the door and they pull into something. I'm like, what's that? They're like, it's a driveway. I'm like, that's dope. We don't have them. Where I'm from at government housing, you just have like a curb in England. So we go in and we open the door. And I was like, these guys must be rich. They had a two-story house. I was like, it's like a house on top of a house. And then they showed me the garden. And at the time, this, this guy was a chef. And so there was herbs and 
berries. And I'm like, dude, this is like Narnia. Like, this is awesome. They showed me this big thing filled with water. I'm like, what that? They're like, that's a pool. I'm like, what's that for? They're like, for fun. I'm like, what's a fun? I was like, this is crazy. Go inside and they show me this room. It's like big and it's got these like shelving. I'm like, who lives here? They're like, the food. This is a pantry. I'm like, yo, your garlic's got it better than I do. This is dope. He then cooks me a meal. I didn't tell the 9 a.m. this. He cooked me a meal. He cooked me chicken and potatoes. And I was like, I didn't know food could taste like that. I was used to baked beans and Ribena. No shade to Cheryl. She was busy. <laughs> so we had the best day. I felt the spirit of adoption coming upon me. It's like, this is great. And then we went home. I remember that night sitting in my bed. Foster sisters are playing with dolls and Spice Girls on in the background. If you want to be, man. You know. <laughs> Probably shouldn't sing that in church. I'm sitting there and it was government housing. We had bars on our windows and it was like a, the sounds of Hackney were ringing out across, you know, the neighbourhood. <laughs> it's full on. I'm sitting in bed. And I was like, I don't like Hackney anymore. <laughs> now, luckily... Two weeks later, that couple came back and signed the papers and adopted me. And they're my parents now, and they were pastors. And they weren't rich. They were young adult pastors share housing with a bunch of other young adults. But you can clap that if you want. I'm not, I'm not a, a gang leader in Hackney, which, by the way, I would have been great at. And so, but what happened? Because before I went to Cheam, I loved Hackney. Hackney was my place. I had my duck. I had my sisters. I had my beans. Turned down for what? Like, I loved it. <laughs> what happened was, unfortunately, I was exposed to a better way of living. I was exposed, my mind was open to how life could be. You know, I think that is why we do everything we do. I think that's why we have Nations Conference. Acting like I'm on staff here. I think that's why we, we have church. I think that's why we have youth and youth leaders retreat and connect groups and serve nights and all the things we do. It's not because we want to have more events. Trust me, we don't. There are lots of work. It's because we want to expose you and me to a different and a better way of living. Because when you come into encounter with Jesus Christ, He calls you up higher every time. Every time you encounter Jesus, He invites you to a new level of living, a new lifestyle. Every encounter is an invitation to lifestyle. And so we meet with Jesus, we meet with God, we sit in His presence and He speaks truth to our heart and says, come up a bit higher. This is why we do everything we do. We've got a story here that we read at the start in Genesis about the Lord trying to call Abram higher. If we go back quickly to the story... Bless you. Let's see what we can pick up in the text. The text starts with the phrase, after these things. It's great, uh, you know, to, to actually study the context and the literary application of Scripture. What is it after? My uh, college principal, I'm doing my bachelor's in theology at the moment, my college principal always tells me, Fred, ask all the questions all the time when reading the Word. So what is it after? This is after... 10, 15 to 20 years, scholars thinks, of seemingly unfulfilled promises in Abram's life. He was up at the hill at Shechem and God says, look to the east, south, west, about three chapters before 15, saying, I'll give it to you. In chapter 10, he says, you're going to be a father of many. He has had word and prophecy and none of it's come to pass. Can any of us empathize with Abram? Have you ever been in your life and you've gotten a prophetic word or an encouragement, but then your life seems to do the exact opposite? Someone's like, hey, I just see, mm, I just see the father saying that you're just going to be wealthy, wealthy for the kingdom. You're like, praise God. Amen. Like three weeks later, Optus sends you like a $2,000 phone bill. You're like, what happened? The Lord's abandoned me. <laughs> maybe it's something more serious. Maybe you've gotten words about having kids or maybe words about family members coming back to Christ or, or maybe words about your calling and none of it seems to eventuate. And you get to that place where Abram is, where you're like, if I get one more prophetic word, I'm going to slap someone. Get away from me, Corey Turner. I don't want to hear it. I don't care. I don't care about your chiseled jaw and your... your... I don't care. This is where Abram's at. Abram's in a place of, I'm not interested. 
But really, if we dig a bit deeper, he's disappointed. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, it says in Scripture. You ever been there? You were hoping, you were believing, you stood in faith and you didn't see the victory. You were hoping, you were believing, you were tithing, you were serving, you were doing all the things. But the situation didn't seem to change. Can I tell you, and this won't get many amens, but between the birthplace of the prophetic word and its fulfillment is a journey and a waiting of character that will make sure you can sustain what he gives you. And it's the worst. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine? Where's Pastor Matt? There he is. Can you imagine a sermon series? <laughs> right, and you pr- pitched it to the church. Pastor Ken's on the screen and he's like, church, I'll try and be like Pastor Ken. I can't. Church, <laughs> church, we're about to go into a new six-week preaching series on the promise won't be fulfilled anytime soon. <laughs> We'd love to see you. Cross Wayne Gowra, Belmont, Scarborough. Bunbury, Mari, help. Paul Kennedy, are we good? Cork, Cork. (laughs) It's going to be great. Make sure you come. By the way, we're not talking about, we're not going to then pray for the promise to be fulfilled. It's just, we're just going to talk about the promise won't be fulfilled anytime soon. See you at church. You'd all be like, holidays. But it's actually a preaching series that would be really, very relevant to lots of us in here. Because many of us sit, And watch other people receive their miracle. And wonder why we haven't received ours. It's easy to, I guess, judge Abram on his attitude. But it's been me and you so many times. So what what can we do? We need a a bit of hope in here. Quick. (laughs) Quickly. Quickly. God, it says in the text, the word of God comes down. Aren't you thankful that God comes down? into our immaturity, into our pain, grief, sickness. He comes down. And he speaks to him. Theologians believe he spoke to him audibly. Now, we've got some serious disappointment. I don't know about you. If you were worshipping the Lord, sorry, if you were sleeping, and then you woke up and the Lord was there, you would quickly put some clothes on, (laughs) fall on your knees and probably start worshipping. But Abram goes... What good are all your promises? It's like, yo, Abram, sassy as. Like, this is God. And God doesn't come down and go, hey, Abram. He comes down and goes, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. I am your protection and your provision. Abram goes, what good is all that? I don't have a kid. I find it theologically wild that the man that would become the father of nations was disappointed and despondent because he didn't have one kid. It's a word for someone this morning. You're holding out for one kid, but God is saying, oh, if you would lift your gaze, if you would lift your eyes, there's far more than that. There's far more than one kid. There's far more than one song. There's far more than one miracle. There's far more than one business. But you've been hurt and disappointed and you've, you've, you've checked out because of the disappointment of step one. God wants to take you to step 50. The thing is, it's in his timing, not ours, which is so annoying. I want to give you three points quickly. It's, it's early, but if Brother Keyboard, if you could join me, that would be phenomenal. We need, a, we need a minstrel up in here. Point number one is it's time to get out of the tent. Mainly because tents are the worst. <laughs> Dude, they're the, there's no time. They're the worst. A tent in, in this, everything's a typology, everything's a type and a shadow. And we study scripture, our main job as a preacher, as a pastor, but even as a believer at home reading the word is, how can I apply this to my life now? I'm not just reading stories, I actually want a practical application. I don't want to preach to you Sunday, I want to preach to you Monday. Yeah. And so when we look at this and we see God come down and go, hey, Abram, let's, let's get out of the tent. What I see and what I interpret from the text is God saying, hey, get out of that stinking thinking. Get out of that paradigm, attitude, posture and mindset that is poison. I've got so much for you, son. I've got so much for you, daughter. You've let the enemy put you in this prison of the mind. There's a reason why Paul writes to the Romans and says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I-N-G, continuous. The renewing of your mind. 
it's time to get out of the tent. What, what, what have you been thinking lately? I firmly believe that if the devil can't dissuade you of the reality of God, he will distract you from your destiny. Too many of the Western church have become blessed assurance Christians. What does he mean? We come and we sit in church on our blessed assurance and we do nothing and we listen. Church was never designed to platform one man or woman's gift. It was designed to stir hundreds, to stir thousands, to step out. When I was young, <clears throat> I guess I still am. Is 31 young? I don't know. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I was going to Wet n Wild. Wet n Wild is a water park in the Gold Coast. And I was so excited. It was block exams. I don't know if you have them here. And I, I wasn't very smart, so I wasn't doing many of them. And uh, my friend said, let's go to Wet n Wild. He just got his P license. I was like, let's go. So he started picking up at eight. So he arrived at eight. I slept in because I was a teenage boy. And he starts honking. And I couldn't find my boardies anywhere. So I did what any reasonable 17-year-old guy does. I got my jeans and I cut them into jorts. I don't want to stumble anyone, man, but I was rocking the jorts, the yellow Havanas, and a salmon pink cotton-on singlet, two sizes too small. I'm telling you, man, the glory was there. So we go to Wet n Wild. We had the best day. We're running around. We're going to Terra Canyon. We're going on the wave riding. You don't know what any of these are, but I do, and it was fun. And about halfway through the day, I started to feel a bit of pain I want to tell your friend that denim and water don't go together I want to expand on that and say denim and water and my Kim Kardashian thighs do not go together I don't want to be rude in the house of God but your boy he thick okay when I run I could start a fire you know what I mean my thighs fellowship when I walk you know I ain't no thigh gap up in here you know what I'm saying like we, we're ready and so at about 4 p.m. I was like, man, I am in serious pain. I was walking around the water park like this. <laughs> you know, and you're a teenage boy, so you just you want to keep going. You're like, come on, guys, come on. We gotta go check. And I went to the bathroom. I gotta be careful because we're in the house of God. We gotta be careful, right? I don't wanna, I don't wanna, you know. And so I took my jorts off, and no exaggeration, I was bleeding from each thigh. So I went, nope, pulled it back up, tied it back on, off we go. But the thing is that those shorts were the completely wrong thing for me. In the wrong environment, they were causing me to bleed. Now to make a big exegetical leap. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta call it. I just wanted to tell you about my shorts. Your depression, your anxiety, your addiction, your unforgiveness towards your parents. It's not right for you, it doesn't fit, it's causing you to bleed. Oh, it did work, cool. But I'm serious, you know what I mean? We, we, and we do what I did. We just button up our unforgiveness. We button up our addiction. We button up our home. We go, let's keep going. And the father's going, I got new clothes for you. Why are you wearing what you used to wear? So many Christians, man, it breaks my heart. One of the worst things as a preacher that travels is to look and being a, a, a soon-to-be senior pastor in four weeks, Jesus help me, is that you look at Christians and they're just so bound up. They never attain their God call. We're not sitting around at the rapture bus stop waiting for the end. Heaven is our destination, but heaven on earth is our mission. And we need a collective of believers in Perth that would storm the gates of hell with their spiritual gifts, that would go after the things of God. But before they can do that, you've got to get out of the tent. Band, you can come join me. You've got to get out of the tent. That's number one. Number two, God knows the name and number of stars hasn't forgotten yours I've been in ministry long enough to know you could sit in an auditorium with 600 people and feel so alone don't get me wrong I love it when I get called out for prophetic words it's so fun it's genuine it's powerful it's good but I was that youth kid that just wanted a word just want a word wear bright colours so that the pastor would see you I remember once I was at a youth conference and I was in like this bright beetle t-shirt and Halfway through the message, Tim Hall was like, Brother Beetle. I was like, it worked. But can I tell you something that sometimes Pentecostal preachers don't say? You don't need a word from a pastor. You got a word. You don't need clarity on your vision. You got a great commission. Start there. I just want them to see me. I just want to be seen. I just want to be known. I just want to... 
they're not bad things. It's not bad to want community. It's not bad to want to be seen and loved. We, we, that's, a, that's okay. But let me ask you the, probably the most hectic thing I'll say in this message. In your life, is Jesus enough? Is he actually enough? I'm so excited to go home tomorrow and hug my baby daughter, Micah. I could cry if I talked about it too much, but it was a hard half a decade to get there. And for the first three years, I, I, I remained in faith. Supporting my wife and, hey, we're going to see this happen. God's going to come through. It's going to be a miracle. I, I stayed strong. Where my faith wavered, interestingly, was when I started to pray for people that couldn't have kids and they got healed. I prayed for one, two, three, up to eight couples that were totally barren and miraculously fell pregnant without like IVF and stuff. And I started to doubt and I started to go, has God missed me? So I went to my office, closed the door. I'm a pacer, as you can see. I was pacing up and down the office. Can I tell you something? God can handle your honest emotion. He loves it when you get honest and real. Shunammite woman vibes, grabbing the ankles of the person of God. So I went in there and I said, hey God, um, it's so cool how you've been using me as a vessel to heal people that can't have kids and it's really great and I felt the Lord being like, what do you really want to say? And I was like, hey, did you forget about me? This, this is really what Abram's saying, right? Hey, the words are great, but did you forget about me? I said, Lord, I love you and I honor you and I'm your servant, but this hurts. This sucks. What I hoped he was going to do was come down into that office and say, son, in six months you're going to have a child. Or son. He didn't. You know what he said? He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, hey, Fred, am I enough? I got mad. I'm going to be honest. I said, that's not fair. You know you're enough. I've been serving you for 14 years. I've turned down money. I've turned down roles. I've been faithful with what you've put in front of me. He said, you have. Thank you. Am I enough? I started to get worked up, man. I was like crying in my office. I was like, I, I don't know. I'm going to say it again. He loves it when you're honest because he can minister to the honest you. He can't minister to your mask. And I said, Lord, I... He said this to me. I haven't told people this before. I've told people that, but not this bit. He said, do you still love me if you never have kids? I said, what? He said, I know you'd still love me if you never preached again, if I never did signs and wonders, but if you never had a kid biologically, would you still love me and would I still be enough? Be real with you. I sat down on the floor and I said, I think, I think so. God's got to be enough. The cross has to be enough. I pray in your life, friend. I pray you walk into miracle on miracle. I pray that all your family gets saved. I pray that God comes through in amazing ways. But if he doesn't, is he enough? Makes me think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, probably my favorite bit of scripture in the whole Bible, if I'm honest, where they're in the fiery furnace and they're being told to worship a false idol and they, they say the famous phrase, right? Oh, King, our God will deliver us from this. But even if He doesn't, we will not bow. Can I tell you, that's where faith becomes real. Is God, you are not the waiter in the sky. Rather, you are my King and my Lord. And I believe you are willing and able to deliver and heal and set free. But my faith in you is not predicated what I can get because what I got on the cross was everything I'll ever need. There's something that sets a blaze in the believer when the cross of Calvary becomes enough. And don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm a faith guy. If any of you are sick this morning or have issues in your body or please come to the altar, we're going to believe in faith. We're going to, we're going to come at you like fire-breathing evangelists. Like I believe it, but I'm just saying it's important to have a theology that's balanced that even if he doesn't, he's not a genie. He's my Lord. And this is the journey that God is taking Abram on in the text. Are you okay? We're almost done this morning. Number three, the limitless sky 
is our portion. God takes Abram outside, outside of his stinking thinking, outside of his attitude, posture and paradigm. You would have thought he'd prophesy over him and say, hey, I know it's been hard with you and Sarah and Eleazar and all the situations. He goes, do you see the stars? God is so cheeky. Do you see the stars? Abram's like, yes. He's like, uh, count them. I'm like really literal. I would have been like, okay, one, two, three. Ugh. One, two, three. God was not trying to ensure that Abram could count. He was reminding him where his help comes from. I look to the mountain. That's where my help comes from. I lift my gaze. Some of us have been so looking at the lack in our lives, we forgot to look at the beauty of God. We've forgotten to look at the Alpha and Omega. The Father, the one who is holy forever. Remember that old song? And the things of earth become strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Some people here this morning, you don't need a prophetic word. You don't need someone to lay hands on you. You just need to look at Jesus again. You just need to look up. Because let's be real, we could bury ourselves in two minutes with life family members, finances, situations. That's where my help comes from. You're not from here. (laughs) You're not from here. You're a spirit with a body, not a body with a spirit. You're an ambassador of heaven. You will, this this isn't going to get amen. You will never feel totally comfortable here because it's not your home. You are emissaries. You're ambassadors bringing the kingdom of God to a hurting and broken world. And the devil would love nothing more than to distract you with the brokenness in your life and your sphere that you would never bring the oil of heaven. But what if this morning you got out of the tent, you got out of the disappointment, you looked up, you started counting and you went, because what happens when you start counting is you start going, God, you are good. You have been good. Maybe it's not stars you count. Maybe it's testimonies. Maybe you get the rear view mirror of your life and look back a couple of years and go, oh God, you did come through. Oh, you are good. Actually, that is your nature. This is why we worship. This is why we sing. We're not reminding Him who He is. We're reminding us. God's not up there going, Gabriel, that's a good point. I am holy forever. (laughs) It's for me. It's for you. So in a couple of minutes, we're going to count the stars. We're going to worship. We're going to pray for some people. Can I really quickly tell you a couple of testimonies? It's, it's that time. It is. The jacket was worth it for a bit. And now it's, 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 thank you, Pastor Shannon. Fill in, Lord. One day I'm going to throw my jacket at someone and they're going to go down under the power. And, and even if they fake it, I don't care. I'll tell them to. I'll be like, bro, I'll give you 20 bucks if you just. I'm just kidding. I'd give them 50. Please do not tell Pastor Ken how cheeky I've been. He'll probably watch it. Hey, just a couple of testimonies from, from my life. And, and I hope in the last 20 minutes you've realized that I am nothing special. And I'm a guy with no family. I have a family now because God places those without family into family some. But I, I came from nothing. and I only started Bible college two years ago, but the Lord has opened doors. Preached at most of the biggest churches in our country and preached for Hillsong this year. And I'm not in any way flexing. Well, I am a tiny bit, but... What I'm mostly telling you is, if He can use me, He can use you. Maybe we'll all preach the Hillsong next year. (laughs) Praise God. But God wants to do crazy things in you and through you. I'll tell different testimonies than I did at the 9am. It's because it's fun to talk about the things. By the way, when we tell testimonies, whoever it is, pastors, leaders on Facebook, we're not trying to be legends. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. When we say things that the Lord has done, it builds faith for Him to do it again because He's no respecter of persons. What He's done for one, He'll do for another. I was in uh, a a city in China that I won't say, preaching to the underground church. And I was 17, 18 years old. I recommitted to Christ at the start of year 12. So I'd been saved, recommitted probably a year and a half. And I went on a mission trip. And my youth pastor at the time, his parents run an underground church network in this city. And 
he was meant to preach and I was going to like, you know, go and pray. And I didn't know what to expect. You know, is it just people in caves? Is it well, like, what is it? Like, you don't know. And if you've seen Finger of God, they're literally out in the rice fields gathering away from the police in caves. So I had no idea what to expect. And that evening, my youth pastor gets a call to go and minister to 150 underground church pastors in another city and goes, you're going to preach tonight. I was like, what? He's like, you're going to be great, bro. He was American. He's going to be great, bro. I was like, I don't have any sermons. He's like, do the one about Joseph. I was like, that wasn't a sermon. I just said like, I read the story of Joseph at youth once. <laughs> He's like, it's going to be great, man. You got this. So I'm in this dingy motel in this city. And they're like, we're going to pick you up at six o'clock. I'm like, okay. They pick me up in a white van. And they say, pastor, get in the back. I'm like, not a pastor, but sure. They put a sheet over me and they tell me to be quiet. I'm traveling somewhere in a van in a city where Christianity is illegal with no sermon. I'm there and I'm like, I just, I just, I just want to go back to North Lakes. I want some Nando's. I really want to make sure I get to see the Avengers movie when it comes out. Like I don't want to be here. So I got there. I was expecting about 15 people. It's an English learning center. But in the inner sanctum, there's a secret church. And we go there and there's one guy on a guitar, one minstrel, and he's playing and he's singing the old Jesus culture song, I love, I love your presence in Chinese. Off key, terrible playing of the guitar. What I, what I, what I need to say. What I, what I, what I need, yes. And there's about 250 people in the room. <laughs> you want to see hunger? People that could lose their lives for Christ with pages of the Bible who have traveled days to be in a meeting. And I'm preaching. You see, God loves doing this. If you read scripture, I'm about to finish, but I want to stir you. God loves using his kids. And so the elder comes up to me and goes, Pastor, how long will you preach for? Two or three hours? I said, my guy, five to ten minutes. <laughs> and he goes, ay, ah. Uh, oh, so I run to this little side area. I'm like, story of Joseph, story of Joseph. I get up. I'm going to be super honest. I didn't even know there was going to be a translator, which I should have thought of. This girl, Meredith, is like, I'm going to be your translator. I'm like, what? So I get up there. They're all looking at me. I preached a message on Joseph for 20 minutes. It was terrible. I got everything wrong. I'm like, and then Joseph went to Egypt. And then after that, Potiphar was on his way to Paris, not Paris. And then Potiphar went to the jail. And then Joseph ran away and didn't want to sleep with someone. And then, and, you know, and then the provision of God. But every time I would say Jesus, my translator would say yes to, and the whole congregation in unison would go, Amen. And so I needed encouragement. So I just started saying Jesus for no reason. Like, Jesus loves you. Jesus is going to use you. And she's like, yeah. They're like, Amen, Amen. At the end of the sermon, you know, I can laugh about it now, but I'll be real with you. I felt like such a failure. I felt like I'd let my youth pastor down. I felt like I just felt so terrible. But I thought, well, I better do an altar call. So I said, if anyone here wants prayer, would you come to the altar and we'll pray for you? 200 people stood up and walked forward. I was like, no. No, it's not what we wanted. <laughs> Meredith goes, pastor, let us pray. I'm like, Meredith, I'm not a pastor. I'm 17 and I'm homesick. <laughs> I go to the left of the stage. There's a young man, a stage. It was like a step. <laughs> and Meredith, Meredith was trying to be helpful. She's like, these government official sons never been to church we must see them saved I said Meredith shut up <laughs> she didn't care she's like this one is called Ikwai which means turtle I was like okay turtle lift your hands <laughs> I put my hand on his chest I said gee he fell down Never been in a church service before. Never YouTube Bethel or Hillsong. Oh man, God will use you. Without qualification, in fear and trembling, unsure, unqualified. 
I started moving a lot. Started praying. People started falling over. People started crying. People started getting their heavenly language. A lady I prayed for started praying out in English. I was like, oh, amazing. Doesn't speak English. Start moving along. I'm incorrigible. By the end of the line, I'm like, in the name of Jesus, bring him back. Bring him back. Hold the anointing. Like, I'm getting pumped. I gotta finish. I gotta finish. This old lady comes forward. I, we prayed for about an hour and a half, right? And I'm like, this is awesome. This is, this is, I know I like to be funny when I'm telling stories, but I really was like, this is why I'm on the planet. This is amazing. God's good. How good's being young? One minute you're like, I'm aware. The next minute you're like, I am Benny Hinn. <laughs> This old lady comes to the front and she must have been 185. <laughs> she's very, she's very healthy. And she uh, comes forward and I was pretty done. Been praying for, preached for probably 40 minutes, prayed for like two hours. My prayer stamina wasn't good back then. I was like, okay, like we're done. So I get to this lady and she's there and she's huddled over. Sorry. She, she huddled over. She was genuinely so elderly. And I prayed for her, but I just gave her a bit of like, yeah, thank you, God. Bless my sister, you know, like a, oh man. I kept moving on. And I hear this angry Chinese muttering. And Meredith goes, ah, oh, Pastor Fred. I'm like, I'm fine. Yep. She goes, ah, oh, she's just wondering if you could pray for her again. I was like, oh, absolutely. Sorry, ma'am. Oh, Lord, thank you that you love her. Thank you that you're here for her. Amen. Angry Chinese muttering. Meredith goes, I'm afraid. Um, I could tell Meredith's trying to like dumb down what she's saying. Meredith's like, she's just saying that she, uh, she took four trains to get here across two days, three provinces. She spent all of her pension to be here. She has two pages of the Bible, Matthew, and she heard that the person of Yesu was going to be talked about and his power was going to be here. She was wondering if you could pray for her again. I was like, yes. So I pray for her and she looks up at me. She's got a green eye and she's got a totally white eye. And Meredith goes, oh, you should heal her eye. I'm like, Lord, I'm going to kill Meredith. <laughs> I said, okay, let's pray. We prayed for probably 15 minutes, which when you're praying for a healing feels like seven days. I'm praying, I'm praying, nothing's happening. And she's giving me nothing. She's like. Eventually I start to feel like moisture on my hand. I was like, oh, what's that? <laughs> and I like pull my hand away from her eye and there's like this gunk on my hand. First thing I thought was, wow, God's moving. Second thing I thought was, get me a tissue. <laughs> we keep praying, we keep praying, we keep praying. After about half an hour in total, she wipes her eye. She has a bright green iris that is brighter than that eye. I said, Meredith, ask her if she can see. I'll never forget this as long as I live. She goes, share, share, and walks off. I was like, what does share, share mean? Meredith's like, she can see. I'm like, bring her back, bring her back. Meredith translate. She had it at a factory she worked in when she was young. She had acid go in her eye when she was like 30 years old and deteriorated till she, she had no vision in that eye. And in 20 minutes, the Lord totally restored her eye to the point where she could see better out of this eye than that eye. Come on, nations, God will use you. He wants to take you outside the tent. He wants to equip you. He wants to use you. You don't need to be awesome, attractive, have a degree. You just need to say yes. You just need to